One of the biggest plot points in the current story of One Piece has been uh, this concept of a traitor among the ninja pirate Ming Samurai Alliance. This traitor in particular seems to have given away the meaning of the secret encoded message that Kinemon uh, intended to give to the supporters of Odin that indicates the position where the raid of Onigashima will begin at, as well as the mark on the ankle, um, the uh, crescent moon mark, representing the supporters of Odin. What is most interesting, however, is that this is not the first case of a traitor among the Alliance, as there was already a traitor established during the Arc of Zo, and quite possibly these two traitors are one and the same person. But then, who is this traitor? Who is this person that betrayed the Alliance? Well, you probably already realized reading the title of the video where I'm trying to get at, but while it might seem stupid, funny, and absurd at first, once you think about it, once you look through all the evidence, you will realize that this is far from just a joke. Now, to start things off, first of all, we need to really establish if there even is a traitor among the Minks. The reason for that, quite simply, is because Odin never stayed directly. While most of us have already accepted that yes, there is a traitor, theoretically speaking, Oda has never stated it himself. A lot of people have used this to say that there isn't a traitor, that this is all just a matter of coincidences and we're just overthinking things, but if we look at the evidence directly, it becomes very apparent that there actually is one. The whole concept of the traitor particularly started off from this very specific quote from Inorashi in chapter 824. He mentioned to Wanda that the fact that Jack arrived in Zo not once, but specifically twice, undeniably proved that Jack's forces had to be in possession of a Viver card of someone on Zo. This fact in particular is reinforced in Zunisha's Viver card, where it is mentioned that the only way to be able to approach the island is via Viver card. Anything else, compasses, log poses, or anything else just simply won't work. Because the island is always moving, the only way to identify it is to have a Viver card, and as Inrashi says, Jack's forces were in possession of some Viver card of a certain individual on Zo, meaning that that individual likely had to consensually give their Viver card to the Beast's pirates at some point or another. Now, granted, maybe not. Maybe the Beast's pirates simply had a Viver card from someone in Wano, maybe someone who knew Inrashi Nekumamushi, maybe even Odin himself, or maybe of some other thing related to Inurashi Nekomamushi's past in Wano, but while that could theoretically be possible, the problem is that this isn't a matter about just Jack having a Viver card to Zo, it was the fact that he had insider information about the island. Think about it. What is the first thing that Jack says as he steps on the Makomo Dukedo? He says, Bring me Raizo the Samurai. Raizo and Raizo alone. Now, why is this fact important? Because Raizo being on the island was an accident. It wasn't a plan, it wasn't meant to happen. Uh, Kinemon and his group shipwrecked at sea, and Raizo was the only person capable of arriving on the island. In that regard, aside from Kinemon and his group, the only people who knew that Raizo was present on Zo were the Minx. This was a fact probably only to the Minx, and the fact that Jack continuously insisted to bring Raizo, in fact he even went as far as to return to Zo after his defeat, trying to rescue Doflamingo, kinda proves that yes, he knew directly that Raizo was on Zo, and unless it's Momonosuke, Kinemon, or Kanjuro, which I just can't see happening, then it had to be one of the Minx. Someone among the Minx had to give direct information to Jack about Ryza being on the island. Now, granted, you might tell me, but Archer, didn't the Minx know that Ryza was on the island and that he was safe? If there was a traitor, then why not just ride out Ryza? Why just not say the location he's in? Why not just say, hey, hey, Ryza's there, go capture him, it's easy, right? Why not just do it? I mean, everybody knew, right? But it's a much more complicated matter than that, and in fact, it's this detail in specific that kind of helps us narrow down who the traitor possibly was. 
The thing is that it's pretty much directly implied by the fact that no one was able to rat out Rizo that only a few knew of his location. This kind of makes sense because the Whale Tree, the location where Rizo was held, is considered a sacred place among the Minks, and very very few are actually granted access among it. Not even Wanda or Pedro were able to enter there when a Norashi Nekomamushi took the Straw Hats there. Raizo does mention a few other minks, but these seem to be very specific selected vassals of Inura Shinekumamushi who kept Raizo fed during that time. In other words, aside from Inurashi, Nekomamushi, and a few other exclusive servants, absolutely no one was allowed to not just enter the whale tree, but quite possibly even knew that Raizo was there. So while absolutely everybody in the island knew that Raizo was safe and knew that Raizo was there, it's quite possibly that a large part of them just simply didn't know the specific location and thus couldn't write it out to Jack. Now, granted, you could excuse all of this, maybe there's some weird coincidence that led to all of this, maybe Jai had a separate Vivercorn and one of his troops maybe casually found Raizo climbing on the island or something, I don't know, maybe there's just a way that Oda could explain this, and it's possible, but there is specifically one thing that has been brought back that just doesn't seem to make it possible, and it's the fact that there is a traitor right now in Wano. And it's the second time we see among this group of people, this alliance, the Minks and the others, that someone is giving information directly to the Beast Pirates. And while some people have suggested that someone like um, Kyoshiro and stuff like that, I definitely don't think it's Kyoshiro, the way that it was presented within the chapter and the way that Kyoshiro has been acting in Komurasaki's favor and um, in favor of the supporters of Odin just kind of doesn't make him likely and there just isn't anyone else who really could write it out. The person specifically seems to be among the Alliance. This again reinforces that there just has to be a traitor among the Minks or just someone who has to have betrayed the group. And again, maybe this is just some freak coincidence and it's excused some other way, but really there just seems to be a traitor among the Minks. So that begs the question. Who is the traitor? Alright, phew, that was a very big preface, but let's move on to the suspects that we have. Now, first of all, I think that the traitor has to be a character that is relevant to the story. Uh, I think that at this point, because see how big of a plot point it is, it has to be someone important. I know there were tra theories back in the day that maybe Barit or someone else was the traitor, but those characters are just simply too relevant to the plot for me to really think that it me makes any sense to really have it as a big plot twist. Like, okay, that that monkey from Zoe is the traitor. Who cares? You know, it it's just such a minor character. So, you know, maybe who knows? Maybe it is Barit, or maybe it's Miyagi, or Peckham's mom. But I just don't think it is one of the minor characters. So honestly, I'm just gonna bear out all the minor characters, aside from the important ones. And I'm also gonna put there uh, the three musketeers. I'm gonna put in there uh, Sicilian. Uh, Giovanni and Consolat, because I personally think they just aren't really relevant um, enough to be the traitors. So, to put it very simply, we're gonna narrow down the important links to five people. Inorashi, Nekomamushi, Pedro, Wanda, and Carrot. Now, starting off, I think we can actually shave a few of these already. Inorashi, Nekomamushi, boom, I think they're very easy to shave. First of all, just like Inemon and Kanjuro, we've seen their devotion to Odin and just how incredibly passionate they are. Not just that, but they lost a whole limb during the attack on Zo, and I get it that Jack had to make it realistic, so maybe the real traitor also got injured, but I think it's ridiculous to cut off a whole limb just to prove that, like, oh, they're innocent, just to play the whole thing off. I mean, goddamn, it's ripping off a limb. But not just that, they also knew perfectly well where Ryza was. They knew about the location of the whale tree, and thus it, it just makes it incredibly rare for them to really be the traitor. So I think we can easily put those two aside. This leaves us with uh, Pedro, Wanda, and Carrot. And particularly Pedro, I think, is one of the more interesting cases. I just kind of think that Pedro, again, is just someone who has shown a lot of loyalty to Inorashi Nekomamushi. His favorite card goes to great lengths to show just how passionate and devoted he is to the two of them. In fact, his favorite food is the same as Inorashi and Nekomamushi's favorite food because he's that loyal. Literally says, 
just that. So the fact that he's devoting himself so much uh, ever since his youth, and in fact we've got a flashback to prove that, to motivate that, it just makes it again so unlikely that he actually would be the traitor. In the end, he even went as far as to sacrifice himself for the people that Inuashi Nekomamushi and the whole Koski clan he claims believed in, so for him to betray the clan like that, it just seems kind of ridiculous. He went as far as to say that absolutely above all else, Inuashi and Nekomamushi must not die, so you know, it just seems so unlikely. So now we have Wanda, and Wanda you know, for a time I thought that maybe she could be the traitor. Um, alongside Carrot, she was one of my biggest sub uh, suspects because, well, she's... Everyone else is just easily to confirmable, and Wanda doesn't necessarily have so much directly against her. But I think that, once again, the way that we've seen her react to things more than anyone else really kind of makes it hard to believe that she's the traitor. One has been... Let's just put it really affected by the Takanzo. It's shown several times just how harsh it's been, and she's cried. She's just shown so much emotion, and granted, maybe it's just acting. In fact, the fact that she shows so much emotion could just be all part of her bigger acting and stuff, but it's been done to such an extent that it just seems kind of hard to believe. In fact, uh, her Viver card, again, mentions that Wanda was really traumatized by that whole thing and in the scene where she snaps at Nami where she just starts screaming at her it says you know that's a point where it just frustration kicked in it's just like she was desperate it's like why why does this have to happen you know why why could you be how could you be so ruthless and seeing that to me just makes it so hard in fact it feels like Oda oh, is going to lengths to just kind of say like no it can't be Wanda what goes even further to prove this is the fact that one has been strongly implied to actually be the princess or I guess uh, the inheritor duchess of the Mokomo Dukedom. Uh, it's been hinted a few times that she might be Inurashi's daughter and her fever card in particular strongly hints at this. It says that the royal dress of the Mokomo Dukedom is actually hers. She's the one that owns it and that's why she exchanged it with Nami which strongly seems to imply again that she is the daughter of Inurashi. I mean they're both dogs, they seem to have a very close relationship. Um, one that was really really moved that um, you know, Inurashi managed to survive, so that seems very likely, and if Inurashi really is her dad, then, I mean, it just seems kind of hard to think that she would just allow her dad to get hurt so easily, as well as the whole kingdom that she's meant to inherit, so, again, I just don't think it's Wanda. So, all of that leaves us left with Carrot, and, well, what can we even prove against Carrot? Now, granted, at first, glance you might say well there's a lot we can prove out Karen she's such a nice and cheerful girl and like she's got no motivation but I think that's mainly the key thing that really solidifies Karen being the biggest suspect here it's just specifically the fact that while there isn't so much to prove directly that she's the traitor there really isn't much that proves that she isn't I mean look let's put it simply who is Carrot? No, really, who is Carrot? We've never really known about her. We've never really had anything established about her. She's just a mink. She's just a mink and Zoe. We know no background, we know no history, no heritage, no nothing that ties her to anything. Her own presence in Zoe as a whole is a complete enigma. For Inuyasha no Kumamushi, we got full backstories relating to Odin and the Samurais of Wano. There's clearly a lot of history between the cat and dog. For Pedro, we got his flashback with Goldie Roger and his ambition to finally one day get his turn in life. Even Wanda, not only do we see her in Pedro's flashback being very young, but we actually see her specifically uh, being hinted to be the daughter of Inurashi, which, which once again kind of ties into her story, but Carrot she's just there there's no story nothing has been established about her even though she's quite possibly the most relevant mink in the whole storyline so far now granted some people will say but arthur we did get a flashback for carrot did you forget yes technically when pedro died there is this brief flashback of carrot that shows her trying to train to be a musketeer and pedro giving her her you know fighting gloves and kind of training her to become a proper warrior yes that's true but you have to consider something. Look at Carrot there, and look at Carrot now. They're almost identical. This flashback happened 
very little time ago. It happened probably just some years ago at best, you know, uh, two, three years tops. Carrot is 15, she's at the age where she constantly changes. Even just three years ago she would be 12 and she'd look way younger than this, so this had to be in the recent past. This is just a recent memory of the time she was in Zo. and if she really is the traitor, if she really was a mole the whole time and she was sent there in Zo since she was young, then obviously this is completely relevant. Carrot's true history is completely unknown, it's just a complete mystery. In particular, I think what's kind of interesting is that there really is no tie to Carrot's heritage despite being so young. I mean, she's 15 years old, she's still just a young teenager, yet no family of hers is mentioned. Now, granted, yes, we don't know Pedro's mom or something, you know, I'm not asking that, yeah, we need to know her parents, but I find it particularly interesting that when she leaves so, when she asks Pedro to not bring her back, she says that Wanda will be mad. The only one that's really brought into the equation is Wanda, suggesting that she's probably her only guardian, or at least the only person that kind of looks a bit after her. It seems to suggest that she doesn't have a direct family, she doesn't have someone to look after, and thus it's probably just an orphan who's been raised by the entirety of the tribe on Zo. But that, more than anything, just brings into question just where did she come from? Now, we'll focus more on that later, but something that I want to focus more on right now is specifically the fact that not only is Carrot's past an enigma, but also her events surrounding the war on Zo, the battle against the Beast's Pirates, and how she pretty much is, among all the relevant characters, the one has the least presence there. Now, let me just ask you something. How many panels do you think Carrot appears in during the entirety of the battle in Zo. Uh, now, keep in mind this is sticking to the manga, not the anime, only the canon of the manga. How many panels do you think Carrot appears in? Two. Two of them. Literally only two panels during the whole war, and boom, we never see her again. One panel she's entering in to fight, and the other one she's posing as the group retreats. Nothing else. She was there, that's all we see, but we don't see her entering any enemies, we don't see any enemies entering her. Now, not saying that she couldn't have done both, because, you know, hey, we gotta keep it realistic, but still we don't see any of that. And after the whole thing is over, after the gas is deployed and all the minks are suffering, she's gone. She's disappeared, she does not appear in any form for a very long time, and the only moment she appears is after the Swirly Hats have arrived, and they started seeing everyone, she just coincidentally pops in, she's just there with Brooke, hey, on see all people, boom. Out of nowhere, just present there, despite the fact that she completely disappeared in advance. We get to see Murashi, we get to see Nekomamushi, Pedro, Wanda, absolutely everyone who is a fighter, you know, every member of the Musketeers, um, even just background characters with no names, we still see them being heard. Carrot just isn't present, just she isn't there. She wasn't directly involved in the battle, and that automatically makes her such a big suspect. Now, granted, those are the big points that kind of make her suspicious, but there's really nothing that incriminates her so much directly. But I think there are a few other points and a few other pieces of evidence that really just put this whole thing into perspective and really make it a lot more possible for Karen to be the traitor. One that is particularly infamous is the whole thing about the Viver cards. Yes, it's the fact that Karen's Viver card, unlike the Viver card of all other characters, has a different color. Now, these colors in the Viver cards, in case you're not familiar with them, indicate the uh, affiliation that these characters have to a specific organization. Um, you know, for example, the Straw Hats are red, the Big Mom Pirates are pink, the Marines are blue, and they're very specific hues, so every group kind of has their own specific color. So for the Minx, it's a very, very specific type of green, but Carrot is the only one who doesn't have a specific green. Now, granted, yes, there are kind of small mistakes, um, you know, sometimes with the sprinting, because so of course different inks, and some cards can look mildly different, but Carrot's looks distinctly different from any other cards. And what's more particular is that this is something that I verify with other people is present in every single printing of these favorite cards. This was not a printing mistake, this was a conscious choice of making Carrot's card of a different color. 
And what's more interesting is that this different color seems to be much closer to the color of the beast's pirates. In our words, it seems like a color mix between the two, meaning that Carrot has an allegiance to both the Minx and the beast's pirates. But uh, to get to this whole thing, we need to ask ourselves a more specific question, and this question is, why would Carrot do it? Now, first of all, I just want to say, just because there isn't a clear proof of motive as to why Carrot would do it, this doesn't necessarily mean that she's not the traitor. I mean, keep in mind, putting some reasons for deciding to kind of betray, aka the reasons for her being evil and standing with the big mom pirates, which we later find out is due to her repressed trauma of being bullied as a child and that whole thing, it's really not explained long since after she's actually revealed as a traitor. Oda didn't really establish why Pudding would act that way until after the point where she was established as the traitor because he just didn't want to spoil it. Similarly, Viola, who also became a traitor in the Dressrosa arc, now granted to a much smaller degree, you know, even then, we didn't know what her motivations were for being a traitor. We didn't know her motivations for being, you know, working with the Don Quixote family. We only much later figured out that the reason why she did it was actually to save her father, and that's why she promised the light allegiance to Doflamingo. But again, we only found out afterwards. Oda first has to prove that she's the traitor, and then she, he can explain why. But even then, let's try to think why could Carrot be the traitor? And to talk about this, I want to talk about the infamous Fourth Calamity theory. Now, if you're out of the loop, the reason behind this is that in the uh, most recent volume of the One Piece magazine, um, there was a panel uh, from chapter 921. Now, in case you don't know, a lot of mangakas often draw uh, manga pages and drawings bigger than they actually appear in the magazine. The magazine versions are slightly cut down to be able to properly fit them into pages, and the official full versions of these images usually aren't available. So, uh, in the One Piece magazine, it actually used the official full renders, allowing us to see small things about certain panels we couldn't see before. One of these in particular was the panel from Chapter 921, where we get to see Kaido and the Three Calamities back in the day. However, this expanded version in particular shows us a fourth calamity among them, and as some pointed out, yes, this fourth calamity looks like Carrot. Now, obviously, a lot of memes ensued from this, of course, like, oh my god, Carrot is actually the fourth commander, she actually overpowered Zoro and almost killed Luffy, she actually is powerful, which she might actually be, but uh, I don't think necessarily that Carrot is a commander. I think more specifically, this might tie into it some way. Now, don't get me wrong, Carrot could be the traitor, and this could be an element of that, and tie into this, or Carrot could also be the traitor, and this means nothing, and maybe this is really just smoke, or it's a completely different plot point. I'm not saying this is necessarily related, so just because maybe this isn't Carrot, because, I mean, obviously Carrot is 15, this was 20 years ago, so unless maybe she ate the Toki Toki Nomi or something, or, or she's lying about her age, obviously this isn't possible, but... I think there are different ways to look at it, and I think those are um, probably one of the better ways to explain this whole thing. One of my favorite ideas is that this isn't Carrot, but it's actually Carrot's mom, or something like that, and that Carrot's mom was a member of Kaido's Calamities. This would explain a lot of things. I mean, first thing first, it makes sense for uh, Kaido to have uh, one of his Calamities be a Mink, because um, we have a Queen, uh, who is most likely a human, we have Jack, who is a fishman, this has been confirmed in his favor card, uh, we have King, who seems to be a member of the Sky Folk, you know, the people from Skype and stuff, or maybe a subspecies of that, but it still seems related tied to that, and, you know, if the fourth uh, Calamity was a Mink, then Kaido would pretty much have four Calamities, of the four main humanoid races in the series. This makes a lot of sense, because Kaido's crew is about beasts, it's about all types of creatures, you know. It makes a lot of sense to have four different calamities, which are four different creatures. And in that regard, Carrot 
having a mother who was a mink among those calamities would make sense. This could easily explain her whole rest of the story. Maybe her mom is now dead or gone, or maybe she's hiding or something, and Carrot's whole mission was to be a mole in Zoe in for, you know, for her mom. She was forced into it. I mean, you've seen how the beast pirates are. She was either just forced until, like, or her mind was forced to submit, like a lot of the others, or she just was forced to do it out of fear, but she probably had to get on Zo on their orders, and she had to, you know, work with them from there, even when they asked, like, okay, who's on the island, tell us, we're going there, let us use your Viver card, she probably had to cooperate, because she didn't have any other choice, she was probably too scared. And in that regard, well, it all fits together, it explains why Carrot is the traitor, and why she could be the one to rat out the people on Zoe. Again, it maybe it's a different reason, but I think it is possible to motivate this way. At the end of the day, you have to look at it this way. Look, this is a Chiroda. If Carrot is a traitor, she's getting redeemed. <laughs> That's just an inevitability with Oda. Oda loves redeeming his evil females, and it's gonna happen if Carrot is the traitor. So I think it just makes sense that she's doing this out of an obligation, out of her ties with the crew, and just pretty much being pressured and forced into doing this, rather than out of genuine malice. I don't think Carrot is necessarily this evil person, she's just someone who's kind of forced to do it because of her situation. I think this in particular is kind of evident when we see her look uh, and react to this situation in Zoe. Take for example this moment from chapter 805. Wanda looks at the crosses where the other minks were crucified and tortured upon. She cries, she feels this deep pain, but Carrot looks away. She looks to the ground as in ex she was expressing shame. Looking to the ground is something that we instinctively do when we're feeling shame and we want to avoid others staring into us due to our own guilt. Now granted, maybe she's just crossed down by all the blood and stuff, but I think it's particularly interesting how she seems to show so much guilt in this expression alone. But if after all that stuff and all of that proof you're not convinced yet, then I want to go back just for a moment to the whole plot point of a traitor in Wano. Now, again, in Wano, Carrot's presence has been a complete mystery. She hasn't been present, we haven't seen her, she's just gone. Now, some people might say, well, it's just because Carrot is irrelevant and she just isn't really important to the plot anymore, which could be the case, but if that was the case, then we'd still see Carrot in the background, we'd just see Oda drawing her alongside the Minx, but no, she's gone. Even in the last big roundup, she's gone, she's not with the Minx, she's not with anyone, she's just completely gone, vanished up into the air. She's nowhere to be seen, once again a complete enigma, and yet, in the volume summary for the latest volume, Carrot is marked as the one of the most important characters in the arc. She's at the very top, even among some of the Nine Red Scabbards, despite the fact that she has barely appeared. Why is she relevant and important? Why is she marked as someone so essential as to be reminded of who she is in the volume summaries, even though she's barely appearing in the whole volume? But if you need one final piece of proof, it relies on what exactly the traitor read it out, and that is the hidden message. Now, the peculiar thing about this hidden message is that the message is meant for the people of Wano. It's only really understandable by those who are in Wano, even many of the Straw Hats were like, well, what's this, or you know, what was Yasuya's update to it? It just wasn't clear. When it comes to uh, whoever batted that out and actually explained the meaning, if it had to be someone among the minks, then someone had to explain it to them. Someone had to explain to the traitor what this message actually meant, because otherwise they wouldn't have been able to mention it. 
So, who was the only mink we've seen in the story who has witnessed a direct and complete and lengthy detailed explanation of what the message is?